Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And good evening to those of you who are joining us remotely. Please allow me to introduce myself to all of you. My name is Kath Baxter, and I am a professional voice coach and a public speaking expert. And I'd like to welcome you to this professional development talk talk, which is entitled How to Speak so that others listen. This evening, we're going to have, and my intention is that we're going to have the, perhaps the longest conversation that you've ever had around speaking. And I want to reassure you in that respect, because we don't talk about talking, and we don't speak about speaking. I mean, when was the last time at the weekend you turned around to your pal and went, how did you speak today? That is literally not a conversation that any of us have. And I want to reassure you, because speaking is actually an unconscious activity. It's exactly the same as eating and drinking and listening. You don't need to think to do any of those things. So we don't. We just speak. However, in your professional lives, there are times when the stakes rise and you realize that there is scrutiny and judgment around what it is that you're saying or indeed how it is that you're saying it. And it's at that point where we need not only perhaps to consider our words, but also consider how we are saying those words. And that's what I want to do this evening. I would like to draw your attention to how you speak. Not from a point of scrutiny or judgment, but from a point of view of curiosity. How can you speak so that other people listen? We're going to dig in to that skill set this evening. So in order for you all to get the most out of this session and you at home, what I'd love you all to do is to start by asking yourself this question. How do you speak? How do you get your messages across? Because this session is going to be interactive, I'm going to share with you a series of actions to take and I'm going to invite you to explore some of these actions with me. And as we explore the actions together, ask yourself, do I do that? Or is that something I've seen other people do? And as we get to the end of this session this evening, perhaps take some time to consider what actions you have taken previously and what actions you might now want to take going forward. So in this spirit of self-reflection, well, we need to get you speaking. So let's get speaking. And in order to do this, we're going to utilise some tools. So we're going to utilise the tools from this game, which is called Articulate. Now, if you've never played this game, actually, let's just do a little straw poll, because I heard a gasp there in the room. Put your hand up if you have played the game Articulate before. Just give me a little bit. Oh, my word. This is like my target audience. So I just want to just give you a little brief understanding of why we're going to play this game. The game Articulate, for those of you who have never played it before, is a thinking on the spot describing game. The aim of the game is to describe a word without saying the word. And every single day in your professional lives, that's what you do. Your entire professional communication is thinking on the spot and describing something. You describe the actions that you took last week. You describe the actions you're going to take next week. You describe the conversation that you have. You describe the project that you're working on. Everything we do is a description. However, when we think on the spot and we describe things, some habits can emerge that may or may not optimise our impact. And this evening, what I want to help you to do is to draw your attention to that. So if you are here in the room, can you get your mobile phone out for me, please? Oh, yeah, I said it was going to be interactive. You know, grab your mobile phone. T 
type into Google the words or your preferred browser, and everyone who's dialing in at home do exactly the same thing. Type into your computer right now the words virtual articulate cards. Now, if you type that into Google, the first hit that you should see should say drummondpark.com forward slash articulate cards, and you should get taken to a red website. And that red website looks like this. And if you scroll down the page, if you are on your mobile phone there, you will find two articulate cards, one on top of the other. And if you click the top card, ooh, six words have appeared. Now, the aim of the game is to describe any word on the card without saying the word that's on the card. And at home, you can do exactly the same thing. The challenge, if you're dialing in, is here, we're going to be speaking to each other, and at home, you're just going to be speaking to yourself. That's going to be the, that's the little challenge, but I challenge you to do it because you're going to get the most out of this session if you give it a go. So for those of you in the room, what I'd like you to do in a second is you're going to pair up, and we'll, we'll sort that out, and you're going to just simply describe a couple of words. Now, a few extra rules. Those of you who have played it before know that you're not allowed to say what the word begins with because that's just a little bit easy. And you're not allowed to say sounds like. So if it was like handle, you're not allowed to say rhymes with candle because that's like a little bit too easy. You've got to work a little bit harder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to play the game. If you're at home, see if you can guess the word that I'm describing. I need glasses to do this. If you're at home, see if you can guess the word I'm describing. If you're in the room, shout out. Please don't leave me hanging in terms of the word that I'm describing. OK, here we go. Right, this is the world category. Um, so this is like a geography category. Um, this is a place. Oh, my word, I can't say the county because the word is on the card. Right. Uh, it has a minster. It's a city in England. It's got a minster and it's up north. And it's also the, the city is also the name of the county. So it's not Manchestershire. It's, it's not Durham, south, south of Durham, York. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. That was, that was quite hard. Let's go for another one. This should be easier. This is the random category. R stands for random. What is the taxi service you've all got on your phones? Well, there we go. OK, so you get the idea. You get the idea. So in a second, I'm going to ask you, for example, the two of you to pair up. Describe the word on the card without, just, without saying the word on the card. And you've got to guess. It's as simple as that. And then I'm going to start to draw your attention to what happens when we think on the spot and describe something. Any questions? OK, let's see if we can get some pairs. And if we haven't got pairs, then we'll move people around. So find yourself a partner. Do you want to just come to the end there? And then, because you'll be able to work with each other a little bit more effectively. Um, could I ask you and, and, and your cult there to, to work together? That's awesome. And we've got, I think, a three here. I think that, or, um, or if you want to, as in, as in if we can go, uh, we'll go into a three here. You can do it as a three because I don't think we have any more pairs, if that's, if that's all right. Fabulous. All right, so off, all right, all right. You can see the keen beans over there. Absolutely, off you go, off you go, off you go. All right. So what I've just asked you to do, um, what you've just engaged in, is something that I call unconscious communication. All you've done is you've just started to speak. You know what you're talking about, so you just start speaking. And that's what we do every single day at work. We just speak. So now what I want to do is I want to draw your attention to what happens as you speak and how you can begin to practice optimizing your impact. So this evening, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at actions that will enable you all to understand how you can communicate with greater impact. We're going to recognize the factors that influence effective communication. We're going to look at how you prepare your voice and your body for optimal communication. And we're going to look at how you can effectively structure your responses. Somebody asked you a challenging question. How can you handle that question and convey your information more succinctly? So who is this random Scottish, just in case you were wondering, woman? <laughs> who is standing here with you all this evening. Well, as I said, my name is Kath Baxter, 
and I'm originally from Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland. And when I was 17 years old, I went off to drama school. I went to Glasgow and I trained to be an actor and I worked in Scotland as an actor for about 10 years. And then I moved to London and I retrained and I did an MA in voice studies. Now that gives me a fundamental understanding of the anatomy and physiology of how we produce sound, but also how we use our words to influence others. But the only reason why I did that was to go back into the drama school environment. And indeed, that's what I did. So for 14 years, I was head of voice here. This is Mount View. It's one of the top five drama schools in the UK and the top musical theatre course in the country. If you take a trip to the West End here tonight, you're going to see actors that I've trained. I'm actually really quite fortunate that some of them were on the tube. You know, when you're looking at the posters on the tube, you go, I know who that is. And that's a lovely thing, and I'm really proud of that. But why am I sharing this with you? The job of an actor is to hold the attention of their colleagues and their stakeholders for two to three hours at a time. And how you do that is my area of expertise, and that's what we're going to be digging into this evening. Now, three years ago, I left Mount View and I returned to being a freelancer and delivering work in terms of public speaking. Just in the last two or three years, these are some of the organisations that I've had the opportunity to work in. And I'm really, really delighted. And if this work resonates with you, you be sure to get in touch with me because I'm a sole trader and I just work for myself. All right, there's the pitch. All right, so what are we going to be looking at? Well, look, this evening, what we're talking about is influence. And all any of you in this room and at home have are simply three tools to influence. Now, you can go to WH Smith, you can read an awful lot of books, but it only comes down to three things. And those three things are your physicality, how you physically convey your messages, your vocality, which is how you use your voice, and then the words themselves. Now, it's those three things when they come together. Now, in your professional life, sometimes your words are written. And my area of expertise comes in when you have to start speaking those words. Now, everybody in this room speaks at around about 150 words per minute. That's the average in the UK, all right? But the crucial thing to understand if you want to influence others is that we all think an awful lot faster than we speak. Let me give you an example. In the last interview you went to, did you sit there going, oh my God, why are they asking me that question? Oh my God, how am I going to answer that question? How what we think about can potentially undermine our impact. So I want to help you to understand what you can do to optimize that impact. How can you speak so that other people listen? It's really important to understand what our communication preferences are, and I hope this resonates for all of you. If you're sitting in a meeting and you are listening to someone else, the number one thing that you want is clarity. Now, that might be clarity of thought. You understand where they're going, but you also want to literally understand what they're saying. So that's what our preference is. For everyone in this room, we want to achieve clarity. But how do you get there? How do you achieve clarity? Well, the first and most important thing is rate of speech. Does the person speak at a rate of speech that makes it easy for you to be able to understand them? Because at the moment I'm speaking to you about 125, 130 words per minute. That's deliberate. But I've already mentioned I'm Scottish. I can speak to you at a good 220 words per minute. But if I start speaking to you at 220 words per minute, it's going to be an awful lot more difficult for you to understand. And I know that some of you don't even come from the UK. So there's a lovely girl here from Germany. And she's just sitting there right now going, oh my God, what will this woman do? Is she going to speak like this for the rest of the evening? Well, I could speak like this, for the, but it's not very useful. So rate of speech really counts. How many of you in your professional careers, raise your hand for me, have ever been told that you need to speak more slowly? Put your hands up for me. Yeah. It's the number one. Look around. Look around and go, oh, it wasn't just me. It's the number one reason why people come and see me for training. How can I learn to manage my rate of speech? And let me explain to you why. Because when you learned to speak, you pretty much started speaking, if you were a car, in gear four. And then you hit gear five and you didn't stop. But no one ever teaches you when you're younger, how do you speak at gear one? 
How do you speak at gear two when you need to influence others? So the next thing that we value in terms of clarity is emphasis. Does the person sufficiently pick out the key words when they're speaking so it makes it easy for us to understand you? I didn't say, does the person pick out the key words in order to make it easy for the other person to understand you? It's exactly the same sentence. One is easier for you to process. One is easier for you to understand. And then for all of you, in terms of your professional lives, if you want to speak so that other people listen, learn how to be more succinct. You know, we are really, really short on time. And as, that, as we get older and as time increases and technology increases, we have even less time. How few words can you use to make your point if you're succinct? So this quotation really, really resonates. The most valuable of all talents is that of never using two words when one will do. But how can you achieve all this? It takes practice. And I want to show you how in a short space of time, you can start to hit some of these targets. So let's look at how we're going to do it. The first thing that we need to do is to prepare to be succinct. And here's the spoiler alert. You're going to have to think and speak at the same time. And I'm going to tell you right now, none of you do that. That's not because you're wrong. It's just because you don't need to. Because your brain goes, I know how to speak. I don't need to think. I'll just do it. So let's discover what happens when we think and speak at the same time. So I'm going to get you to do the exercise again. But this time, really choose an easy word. Really choose an easy word. Look at the word. Think before you speak. And ask yourself this question. As you look at the word, go, how few words can I use to describe this word? However, there is a caveat. You still need to speak in full sentences. Because you can't go back to the office tomorrow and go, meeting, important, now. <laughs> All right? You can't be that succinct. You've got to speak in full sentences. All right? So choose, and you at home as well, choose a simple word and see if you can describe it using as few words as possible. Have a couple of goes each side. Off you go. Have a little go. Think before you speak. Open up those articulate cards again. Do exactly the same at home. No one's there. No one cares. So describe the word without saying the word. And just hold it there for a second. Can you each describe a word now? Do exactly the same thing. Same purpose, same focus, use as few words as possible to describe the word. But just notice, if you go first, do you notice yourself saying either so, right, or okay, or um, er, before you start to describe the word? Just see if you notice that. So carry on. Still the exercise, see if you notice any of those words. Do they appear? They may not but they may appear. Off we go. Carry on. Carry on again. <laughs> well done. You just caught it. You just caught it. You caught it for the first time. Lovely. Carry on. Carry on. Catch some more. Okay. Let's bring it back in. Let's bring it back in. Wonderful. So again, this is... Oh, I wouldn't put that mobile phone away because it's... Oh, no. There's going to be more practice. So... Many of you will have noticed just there, just give me a little wave if you notice a so, a right, or okay, either in yourself or in your partner. Yeah, pretty much. If, in fact, if you didn't put your hand up, I think you're fibbing, all right? I think you're fibbing. And I'm not doing this in order to say that it is bad. The issue is, is that what these are, are filler words and filler sounds. And they're filler words and filler sounds that happen specifically often when you get asked a question. And just you looking at the card is like you're being prompted to answer a question. So someone asks you a question that you weren't expecting. You go, ooh, uh, yeah, right. Um, so, OK, yeah. Uh, and we make a lot of sound. And actually, there's something that you can do that's more optimal than that. So I would like you to do a layer of practice catching these filler words, but instead, employ a thinking space statement. And I'll explain what that thinking space statement is. So you speak at 150 words per minute, 
but your brain's going a lot faster. If your brain is, if your mouth is saying something optimal, other than, ooh, yeah, mmm, interesting, yeah, something a little bit more optimal than that, it gives your brain time to get the ducks in a row and figure out how you're going to describe it. So, the thinking space statement for this game, not for when you go back to the office tomorrow, don't use this as a thinking space statement. Someone asked you a question, uh, this is the people category, is not you're going to be your response. But this your first word as you describe it, if you just look at the card and then say, this is the R category or this is the P category, your mouth is saying something that's a wee bit more optimal and it just gives you time to find as few words as possible to describe it. So let's do a little layer where we use a thinking space statement first and perhaps just give a bit of feedback to the other person in terms of what it sounded like, all right? Try not to say right first. Try and just start with the word this. That's your first word. Have another little round of practice. Have the same thing at home. Have a round of practice. This is the P category. Okay, well done, well done, well done. Bring that round, wonderful. What I'm already hearing is that when you start to think before you speak as a collective, all of you are beginning now to speak a little bit more slowly. And that note that you were given by that friendly colleague when they told you to slow down and your brain went, well, how do you want me to speak then? It's like the most useless note that you can ever be given. If you think before you start to speak, something interesting happens. And it's this, is if you want to prepare to manage your rate of speech, you need to prepare to pause. And as soon as you start to think, that's what you do. You take a little pause. And for me, it's the number one tool in not only the public speaker's toolkit, but in terms of professional communication that can establish your credibility and your influence. Let me just draw your attention to how I'm speaking to you right now. I speak to you, I take a pause. I speak to you, I take a pause. What, um, what I'm not doing is um, filling um, those uh, pauses uh, with and you hear that when you take a pause and a breath instead, there's a little bit more fluidity. So this is the number one tool, the power of pause. Let's just talk a little bit about what pausing is. A pause is a non-verbal form of emphasis. Now, what do I mean by that? Basically, if you pause before a word, it emphasizes what comes after the pause. Now, the most obvious way that I can explain this is how every single actor who has ever played the character of James Bond introduces themselves on screen for the very first time. Now, I'm Scottish. I'm going old school. I'm going Connery. <laughs> Hello. My name is Bond. James Bond. And it's that pause before the bond, James Bond, that makes that name instantly recognisable right the way across the world, right the way across the world, even in places that James Bond is not a normal name. But the reason why I share this with you, because every single one of you, your name is important. And your name might not be close to the cultural majority that you're influencing. You might have a name that might sound, in inverted commas, foreign to an English ear. And if you adequately emphasize your name, you ensure that everyone knows how to pronounce it. And when I introduced myself to you this evening, I gave it a little bit of James Bond. I said, good evening, everyone. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Kath Baxter. And I gave a little bit of space around my name. That was deliberate. So I want to help you to understand how when you have to professionally introduce yourself externally to people who you've never met before, you ensure that they know how to pronounce your name, but also they remember your name. So here's how we're going to do this. You're going to do your very, very best James Bond impression. And you're going to do it to the person who you're working with. So the best James Bond impression is going to go like this. Lads, seriously, I want so depressed larynx that I can't hear where your larynx has gone. Okay? So what you just simply do is, you're, without thinking about it, you're going to turn to the person beside you and you're going to go, hello, my name is Bond. James Bond, your best James Bond one-liner. Three, two, one, off you go. Go for it. 
Go for it. Go on. Anne at home, hello. My name is Bond. James Bond. No, you're the James Bond. It's got to be James. Not your own name. James Bond. James Bond. James Bond. Hi. My name is... I like the, I like the raised eyebrow there. No, that was very good. Okay. All right. Good. So we're going to take this principle, but this time you're going to do it with your own name. So what I'm going to ask you to do is this. Hello. This is my version of it. And I'm still going to give it a little bit of James Bond. Hello. My name is Baxter. Kath Baxter. Do it with your own name. Surname first. Off you go. Introduce yourself to your partner. Amazing, amazing. Swap over. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Give it a go at home as well. All right. Okay. Please do not misunderstand me. Before your next presentation at work, I am not suggesting <laughs> that you go, Hi, I'm Baxter. Kath Baxter. No, 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 no. <laughs> now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to move the, remove the surname. So you just give a bit of space before your first name and you give a bit of space before your surname. So it sounds a professional introduction. Good evening. My name is Kath Baxter. Off you go. Give a professional introduction to your partner. Off you go. <laughs> I think you can... I think, there you go. There you go. And, and reciprocate. Great. Fab. Fabulous. Wonderful. Now, for many of you, that might be the first time that you might have even heard somebody else's name. You're like, oh, I've really listened to it that time. But just that little bit more space can really ensure, because most people do not like introducing themselves. You know, when you introduce yourself for the first time, you're at a meeting, everyone goes around you, yeah, hi everyone, my name's Kath Baxter. That's, that's kind of what we do. But it doesn't make it memorable. And my job is to help you to understand how you can speak so that others listen. All right, so let's take a little look now at a couple of other things with pausing. A pause, if you are thinking that a pause... is this, it isn't, okay? So the, the, those of you who are fearing pausing, it's about quarter to a half a second. Anything more than that, and if the words are not here on the tip of your tongue, you need a thinking space statement, something that's better than a hesitation sound. A pausing slows you down. So if you've got more pauses in your sentence, it literally takes you longer to say the sentence. So for those of you who are thinking, how do I slow down rate of speech, put more pauses into it. And then finally, when you take pauses, it gives you and the other person time to process what you're saying. Your ears can only digest so much information at any one time. So again, just to draw your attention, how can you make your pause more effective? Well, it isn't this. Can't tell me to pause. She said it was a really good idea. She said it would make my presentation. So we've got to breathe. And if you want to optimize how you breathe, which will enable you to communicate more effectively, think more clearly on the spot, manage your adrenaline more effectively when you're under pressure, then we need to look at the impact of your physicality. So your physicality as you communicate has a direct impact on how you deliver your messages. But I just want to draw your attention right now to those of you at home and those of you in this space how are you sitting right now? No scrutiny, no judgment, no moving. No moving. You're not allowed to suddenly go, oh my gosh, what am I doing? No moving. So how is your physicality impacting your breathing right now? Because for the most part, if I was to do, verbalize, and make a sound to what a lot of you are doing, it sounds like this. <laughs> You kind of sit and take tiny little breaths into the top part of your chest. And that's because of how you sit when you are being passive. 
and how we sit when we're not really having to interact. So I'm going to ask you to change your physicality for me for a sec in a second. I'm going to ask you to sit if you were sitting at a formal meeting and you knew that you were about to speak. Can you change your physicality in order to be able to demonstrate to me what that would look like? You're about to speak at a formal meeting, okay? Now, what most of you have done there, the technical term for what most of you have done there is called sit up straight, okay? Which is kind of what we get told when we were kids. But why is it necessary and how can you further optimize it? So as I'm standing, there's a reason why I'm standing. And it's because my rib cage is lifted away from my pelvis. And I hope I'm not teaching any of you how to suck eggs here, but underneath your rib cage is something called your diaphragm. And when your diaphragm contracts, it draws air into your lungs. And when your rib cage expands, it further draws air into your lungs. But because you're all still sitting, as you're sitting there, your rib cages are still compressed into your pelvis. So just even sitting up straight doesn't give you the capacity to be able to replicate what I'm doing right now. But there is a way of doing it. Can I ask you to sit forward in your seat and put your feet flat on the floor? Literally bring yourself to the edge of the seat, okay? Lift it up and out of your pelvis. And I want you to imagine that you've got a table in front of you. So you guys, you wouldn't be exposed in that respect. But when you're sitting up and you're at a formal board meeting, or you're under scrutiny, you're under judgment, and you're sitting on the edge of your seat, what happens is you can all now unconsciously breathe more deeply. So just breathe in through your nose nice and slowly. And you can feel your rib cage expand, and you can feel your belly expand and breathe out in your own time. And then again, take another little deep breath. And you've got so much more space. Your breadth of expression, you can then move your hands. You can be really, really free in terms of communication. Sitting on the edge of the seat with your feet flat on the floor is absolutely optimal in important communications where you need to influence. The problem is this. It's not comfortable. What I'm asking you to do right now is not comfortable. So let me explain why. Sit yourself back. It's not comfortable because as you just went back, the small of your back goes and has a conversation with you that goes, hey, what are you doing that for? Why are you doing this extra work? But that only lasts a little bit. There is not a Teams meeting. There's not a Zoom call. There's not a face-to-face -face meeting that if I have to influence, that I don't sit on the edge of my seat. And no one looks at where you're sitting. They just look at your head, your shoulders, and your upper torso. So this can really allow you to make vocal impact, but also to manage your nervous system when you're communicating under pressure. So what's optimal? To sit towards the edge of your seat. Next couple of things, catch your trigger word. Your next interview, your next presentation, your next update. If your colleague name calls you, you will hold your breath. That is your trigger word. If I was to turn around and go, Kath, I would go, Oh my God, who's asking me the question? What's your name? Reese. And you're not breathing. So it's kind of as soon as, as soon as we get name called, our nervous system automatically kicks into gear and we hold our breath because it's preparing you to jump out of that chair, run away or punch me in the face. I wouldn't suggest that you do either of those things, but we need subglottic pressure in order to be able to move. So we get triggered to hold our breath when someone asks a question or someone name calls us. When you looked at the card, the same thing happened. You held your breath. So we want to remember to breathe. So we go into those meetings going, I'm going to get triggered to hold my breath, remember to breathe. And finally, to optimize the impact is to prepare to speak in smaller chunks and to catch those ums. So let me again draw your attention to how I'm speaking to you. Little bite-sized chunks, then I take a pause and a breath, and I haven't made a hesitation sound yet, and I've been speaking to you for 35 minutes, and I'm not going to, because I'm thinking, before I speak, I'm using the pause to think about what I'm going to say next. And when I started doing this, I started in exactly the same place as you. I practiced with the game Articulate on my own. 
like, a, like, like you are practicing at home on your own right now. You don't need anyone to respond and give you the answer. So this is what to pay attention to. Choose really easy words and see if you can describe that word in as few words as possible. Use a thinking space statement. This is, in the context of this game, the people category, the world category. If you then go, um, look at your partner and go, oh, interesting. I just made a cheeky um. I'm going to start the sentence again. Because the um is indicating that you're thinking faster than your mouth is able to move. So it just is a, it's an alert to just pause and take a second. See if you can catch those filler words and speak in smaller chunks. We're going to do one last round of practice, then I'm going to directly connect what we've done here to what you need to do at work tomorrow. Okay, so let's, one more layer of practice, a couple of words each, a thinking space statement, see if you can start really slowly, and then we'll move it into what we're working on tomorrow. All right, I'm going to start talking, so you all start talking. There we go, there we go, start talking. This is, thank you for that music, thank you so very much. All right, take a breath. As soon as you look at the card, you're going to get triggered to hold your breath. First word is this. Have a little go. Or just say the num just say the letter. This is the R category. This is the W, the letters that are beside it. Yeah, that's probably the easiest. Okay, let's let's bring this round and we're going to just transfer to perhaps to work tomorrow. The most common question, so I'm going to just directly connect the idea of how you play articulate to what happens at work tomorrow. The most common question that you get asked at work is, can you give me an update on X? We have to update colleagues all the time. So I just want you to keep that question in mind. Can you give me an update on the project? Can you give me an update on the conversation? Can you give me an update on the client? Then you have to go into description. So what I want to help you to understand is how you can respond, certainly initially, to questions on updates and keep yourself really succinct. But how do you answer the question in such a way that the other person clearly understands what it is that you're saying? So I want you to keep that question in mind. Can you give me an update on? And the key in answering a question like that is to employ the thinking space statement again. But it's a specific type of thinking space statement. The most common type of thinking space statements is to acknowledge. Now. The simplest version is, thanks very much for asking me the question. The client says such and such and such, so you say thanks very much for asking me the question. However, it only gives your brain so much time to get the ducks in a row. So the thing that you want to acknowledge if the answer isn't on the tip of your tongue, bearing in mind two types of questions in the world, ones that you simply know the answer to, you don't need a toolkit to answer those questions. You just answer. But then there are the questions where the answer is about here and your tongue is here and you're trying to figure out how you can connect those dots. Well, the key is at that point to employ the thinking space statement rather than, ooh, yeah, uh, update. Ooh, right, yes. Uh, which one? Uh, you know, all of that. So the thinking space statement is to acknowledge context, or subtext, or feelings, or emotions. Anything around that question that you've been asked. So an example of an update, let's say your line manager asked you to give an update, but you were not able to give the answer immediately, and you were perhaps a little bit concerned that they were unhappy or concerned about your progress. An acknowledgement statement to give you thinking space might sound like this. James, thanks very much for asking me to update you on X project. I know that you've had a number of concerns about where that project's going, so I'm really looking forward to take the opportunity to talk you through what actions I've taken. I've just given myself loads more thinking space. If you don't know what to say, acknowledge, acknowledge, acknowledge context, subtext, feelings, emotions. I know you're concerned, I know you were worried about this, I know that this is your priority. Then answer the question numerically. Employing a numerical structure is where you put the number at the beginning of the sentence. We remember things numerically. So if you're connecting it and you want to give an update, you say, thanks very much for asking me the question, I appreciate that you are concerned about this project at the moment. 
So I'd like to talk you through some key actions. Firstly, blah, 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 blah. Secondly, blah, 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 blah. Now, I haven't said anything, but you're nodding. Because your brain goes, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> doesn't matter. I didn't, I didn't make any sense at all. But the structure is what we value. And the second way is to give a chronological structure. When you're given an update, we remember things in chronological order. So the simplest thing that you might do is last week we did this, this week we're doing this, next week we're doing this. This morning, this afternoon, this evening. You put the period of time at the beginning of the answer. Because when somebody asks you an update, you might have an awful lot of information to deliver, but you want to do it succinctly. And so this is how you can share information in such a way that you can remember it, but also we all understand things chronologically as well. So that's how you can take the key tools and apply it in terms of the work tomorrow. So we've covered a lot. We've covered a lot. Let's just have a little look at some of those tools that we've looked at this evening in order to speak so that others listen. Pay attention to how you speak. Listen to yourself. Sit forward as you speak. If it's important, if it's an important meeting. Practice pausing, thinking, breathing. Catch your trigger word. Remember, as soon as someone asks you a question, just go breathe. <sighs> breathe it in. Employ a thinking space statement or a landing phrase, which is a bit more optimal than the oohs, the errs, the so's, the rights, the okay's. Always ask yourself, how few words can you use in order to make your point? And then structure your updates, numerically or chronologically. It will help the other person to understand what it is that you are thinking. So my question to all of you this evening is, how do you speak? How do you get your messages across? And what actions you might want to take going forward? You know, if this work has resonated with you, you can find me on Twitter. I'm on the old Twitter, at Pro Voice Coach, or you can connect with me. I'd love to connect with some of you on LinkedIn. And if you would like to find out about any of the services I offer, the one-to-one -one coaching, because 50% of my business is like this and 50% is one-to-one -one coaching, then do feel free to get in touch with me. I'd be delighted. But now, you know, that will have provoked some thoughts, some things, you know, my word, how do I do this? Or those scenarios... So has anybody got any questions in, in terms of how you might be able to optimise your impact or public speaking, voices? These are all things. What's that got you thinking about? Yeah. We've got the mic for people who are listening in online. I'm really conscious now of how Don't. I speak to you. I'm sitting on the edge <laughs> of my seat. I know, and I know, day. I know. Thank Don't you so much for that, Kath. That was not brilliant. At all. Um, when I was younger, I suffered with quite a severe stutter. And yes. as I've gotten older, I've learned to control that a little bit with yeah. some of the things that you've said. Yeah. But I often find I slip back into it in certain situations. Yeah. Would you say that um, does that come from like an extreme version of what you said about us thinking quicker than we speak? Or and how would you recommend, other than what you've suggested tonight, is there anything else that you'd recommend for people with maybe a slight speech impediment or a stutter um, that, that could help them to speak in public? I, I think that what you just articulated to me was scenarios where you start to experience performance anxiety. Any situation where you find yourself in the spotlight, it's going to increase your adrenaline. It's going to increase, therefore, your heart rate and therefore your rate of speech. And if you have historically got uh, a speech impediment or a stutter, then it may well trigger that. So I think the thing is, what I would focus the attention on is your preparation. There are only two tools to managing performance anxiety, and the first is great prep. If you haven't done the prep, you're screwed. <laughs> You'll just be overwhelmed by adrenaline. But if you do the prep then you can focus on techniques on the day. And the sorts of techniques would be to do breathing exercises, to slow down your heart rate, to visualise what you're doing really well. And that would certainly help in that kind of situation. Any other uh, reflections or questions in terms of what we've covered this evening? How do I? Yes. Lovely. How do I? Question. Yes. Hiya. Hello. Um, a couple of questions, really. Yes, perfect. I think it's yeah, all all great. Um, 
Um. <laughs> Great. You, there you go. The thing is that you would never catch it. I know. I know. That's the thing is, and yeah. so so it's the the whole point of this is to go. Oh, I actually exactly. am starting to yeah. listen to myself. Perfect. No, thinking a lot. Yeah, perfect. Think. <laughs> That's all right. That's okay. But talk. What was your question? So my question was in terms of the ways to make the emphasis in on not only pauses but anything about the vocal tone or volume mm -hmm. when you're supposed to speak softer mm -hmm. or louder mm -hmm. or change potentially change your pitch yes anything of that sort you each and every single one of you in this room knows how to sufficiently emphasize specific words when you pay attention to what you're actually saying there's a phrase in english a rhetorical phrase called onomatopoeia which means a word that sounds like it is like fizz bang wallop it's a bit weird but as voice coaches we think that all words are onomatopoeic by nature and your job is to make a word sound mm -hmm. like it means. I didn't say make a word sound like it means. So when you pay attention to what you're saying, you start to adequately emphasize the word, but it is about slowing it down. And work I do one-to-one -one with clients helps them to understand how to increase that use of emphasis. I usually work with opposites. So if you said, today this is going to be a really bad day, I'd say, today's going to be a really good day? And you go, no, bad day. And you work a bit harder to put your point across when you're met with antithesis. So you're saying that it comes just subconsciously? I'm saying that our, we subconsciously understand how to emphasize, okay. but we need perhaps a little bit of coaching sometimes, or to draw our attention to the idea of how to deliver that to in front of other people. If you want to practice it on your own, practice reading out loud. Just literally imagine that somebody else is there. That makes you have to more adequately emphasize and takes the pressure off of what day-to-day -day communication is. Any other, any other questions? Yes? Hi there, thank Hiya. you. When you were working with the performers, yeah. what were the most effective techniques that they took in terms of what they thought was most valuable for themselves, for other performers? Is it? I think that, well, there's actually somebody in the room who I used to teach. At, so Nick, I, I taught at drama school as well. So in one sense, you could, you could, you could ask Nick. But what I, I, I would say is flexibility to go into different situations, having been put in situations and being flexible with how they use their voice, understanding how to be able to breathe more deeply, to, to relax yourself before you go into an important communication. And the other things that actors are incredibly good at and they recognize the value is they practice. Actors don't go on stage unless they've rehearsed. And if you think that these are the first time I've said these words, you are sorely mistaken. They have been practiced again and again and again. I practice my presentations multiple times. That's what affords me the ability to be able to stand here and be relaxed as I deliver my message, because I know what I'm going to say next. I don't know the actual words. It's not scripted, but it's repeated again and again. And that's what gives the, the flexibility. So I work from bullet points, hence the reason. I've got no script. I just use that, which is why sometimes I had to really read it, because otherwise... I didn't know what I was saying next. So using prompts, but they are prompts. So practicing can enable one to do that. Any other? Yes. What advice would you give for people that sometimes sit in their voices? So sometimes they're so in it and they know what they're doing and they know what they're saying, but their voice tends to drop and then they start like drowning out and losing people's attention and it actually sounds like they're bored. And not so interested in the what habit, they're presenting. The, the habit is called repetitive tunes. Repetitive tunes is repeated use of the same intonation pattern. And every single one of us has a repetitive mm -hmm. tune when we are being unconscious. And basically, what it is, is that you give a value to a word. This is my 20 pence word, this is my 10 pence word. This is my 20 pence word, this is my 10 pence word. And so it repeats itself. But a great speaker knows that some words are worth a pound. And some words are worth five pounds. Some words are worth £10. And in a cost of living crisis, <laughs> some words are worth £50. Mm. 
And it's only how you say those words. So that's the issue that I was talking about in terms of emphasis, drawing your attention. If that person is unconscious, there's nothing you can do. And what are you going to do? You're going to lose interest. And that's the whole point. That's why emphasis is the second most important thing. If you repeat the same tune again and again, people will stop listening to you. How do you fix it? You have to draw your attention to how you speak and prioritize it. And when you do, you suddenly start going, oh, my word, people are listening to me. This is weird. People will look at you as well and they'll go like that. Have you... Have you changed your hair? Because they're not going to go, oh, you're now adequately emphasizing your words. So all of this work is so subtle. Millimeters of difference can make a massive difference in terms of your professional impact. Any other questions? Any other questions? We well, do have one online. One online. How wonderful. Uh, this is from Caroline Bedal. Hello, Caroline. She says, lovely to see you again, and a great session. Please tell everyone about your award as a top voice coach. <laughs> smiley face, smiley face, smiley face. That is very, very kind of you, Caroline. I, I'm not, now look. <laughs> Breathe. <laughs> you caught me off guard there, Caroline. Thank you. I was awarded one of the top voice coaches, speech coaches in the country this year by a website that is promoting oracy and promoting great, great impact. And they nominated and highlighted me as one of the top 10 coaches. There was a list. They ordered the list. And in the list, they had me as number 10 on the list. But I know it wasn't in numerical order because otherwise I would have been number one. <laughs> Absolutely. Caroline, lovely, and thank you for joining this evening. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. Do we have any other questions? As No, that is it. Wonderful, wonderful. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well done for joining in. Look at all of that, all of that wonderful work you did this evening. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Do reach out to me if you want to find out anything more about the work. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Ladies and gents, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this Talk Talk at Chancery House. For those online as well, thank you so much for joining as well. As mentioned, this entire session has been filmed tonight and it will be sent out to you guys in one week time and posted online so you can watch back in full. But for one last time, can we have a huge round of applause for Kath Baxter tonight? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much.